Hey everybody, it's your AP Bio teacher, Mr. Poser. Today we are starting topic 2.8, which is on tonicity and osmoregulation. Now, that seems like a, seems like a word full, a mouthful to say, right? But we're going to break this down, hopefully, into two separate videos because there are two really big concepts that we want to get into um, in this topic. So if you remember in our previous topics, we talked about uh, membrane transport, we talked about diffusion, active transport, co-transport and facilitated diffusion, all the different ways that molecules are able to get across the cell membrane. Now, this will be about why it's important for both animal cells and plant cells to regulate how much water and how much solute is able to pass through the cell membrane. And it's important to regulate how much is on either side of the cell membrane because that's really going to affect the cell's ability to exchange materials with its environment. Um, so what we're going to get into is a really big topic today. It's called osmosis. And you may have heard this before, but osmosis is what the passive transport of water across the selectively permeable membrane. It's also just simply known as the diffusion of water. Um, and why does osmosis get its own special term? Why does it... Um, you know, why don't we just call it the diffusion of water? Well, because osmoregulation is absolutely crucial for um, both plant cells and animal cells for them to stay alive. Um, so basically, you know, if we just have a high concentration of water on one side, we'll start with one kind of molecule here. We'll get to talk about solutes in a minute. If we have a high concentration of water on one side of a semi-permeable membrane and a low concentration of water on the other side, of the semi-permeable membrane. Well, what's going to happen? Water is going to diffuse or it's going to osmos. That's not a word. <laughs> Although you can use it if you want. Um, it's going Osmosis is going to happen in such a way that there's equal concentration of water on both sides of that cell membrane. All right. Um, but what really plays a role in osmosis is not only the concentration of water, or I should say the concentration of free water that isn't attached to any kind of solute or at any other molecule. Um, it really, really has to do with the concentration of solutes. And what are solutes? Solutes are any kind of solid that's dissolved in water. Um, so we're not going to get into the whole thing here, but how water is able to dissolve solutes is because of its polarity. And water molecules kind of surround a molecule of the solute to dissolve it. Um, so here's a situation that I want us to take a look at. I tried to cover up the other part of this picture here, but it's not really working all that great. Oh, well. Um, here's, a, here's a scenario. Let's say we have this U-shaped tube here. It's a glass tube, and on the left side of the tube, we have pure water. On the right side of the tube, we have some kind of solute dissolved in water. Let's just say it's sugar. All right, and in between each side of the tube, there's a semi-permeable membrane. Um, and let's just say it's got passages that are large enough for something like as small as a water molecule to pass through, but not large enough for whatever solute this is to pass through. So let's just say it's like sucrose or something. Sucrose is kind of a big molecule um, with respect to water. So let's just say water can pass through the semi-permeable membrane, but sucrose cannot, kind of like a cell membrane, right? So what is going to happen here? Um, in terms of osmosis. What's going to happen in terms of the movement of molecules? Well, yeah, see, I tried to like cut it off here, but it doesn't work that well. Okay, whatever. Um, here's what happens after. Water diffuses from the area of the higher free water concentration to the area of low freer water concentration. So water, which is the pure solvent over here, is going to undergo a net movement to the right side of this tube here, okay? So what's gonna happen is that more water is gonna follow where the solute goes, okay? You would maybe think that, you know, if the uh, semi-permeable membrane would allow for the solute to come through, then the solute would diffuse to the other side, but since it can't get through, okay, water is going to move in such a way that there becomes an equal amount of concentration of water on each side, an equal amount of water, or I should say free water. All right, so water is going to tend to diffuse from a low solute concentration to high solute concentration. So think about that for a second. Okay, we have been drilling into your head that molecules will diffuse from a high to low concentration, right? But water will kind of follow, it'll kind of follow where solutes go. Let's put that, let's put that down here. Water will follow solutes. 
All right, so since we have a lot of sugar on this side, water tends to follow it until there's an equal concentration of what we call free water on each side. All right, so look, this, this side is going to be filled up, and this side is not going to be, um, it's going to start to lower um, in terms of volume. Okay, so that's an interesting thing about osmosis. Okay, and what we're studying here is a measure of tonicity, and that's that first word in that term, right, or, or in the title, right? Uh, so tonicity is the ability of a surrounding solution to cause a cell to gain or lose water. Um, and this and tonicity really depends on what we call non-penetrating solutes. So like in the last example with the U-shaped tube, uh, maybe sugar or salt could be non-penetrating solutes because they can't necessarily get through the, the lipid bilayer um, all that easily. So here's a scenario. I know I, I, I bet you're getting really, really, you know, not tired at all of these you know, drawings that I keep making with all the colored dots. Um, but check it out. We have a scenario over here. We have an animal cell. Let's just say it's a red blood cell. So that means it doesn't have a cell wall. Um, and we have concentrations of solute in green and water in this kind of bluish color. All right. Um, so check out this situation over here. Uh, we looks like we have an equal concentration of solutes on either side of the cell and an equal concentration of water to the inside of the cell. So that means this cell is in what we call an isotonic environment, meaning there's no net movement of water. Okay? There's not enough solute on the outside of the cell to draw water out. There's not enough solute on the inside of the cell to draw water in. Okay? So there's no net movement of water. Water and you know, other uh, molecules are always constantly moving in and out of the cell. Um, but those are at small rates, typically. Um, so there's no net movement. There's not, it's the, as I put down here, the water coming out is equal to the water coming in. And the concentrations of both the solute and the water are equal, right? So animal cells like to be in this isotonic environment where we're not losing too much water, we're not gaining too much water. It's kind of like the Goldilocks situation, um, if you catch my drift. All right, um, but what if... What if, that should be highlighted, what if there's more solute on the outside than there is on the inside? Okay, so look, we have a high concentration of just water and on the inside and a high con or low concentration of water on the outside. So what will happen? Um, well, water is going to, or excuse me, this cell is going to experience a net outflow of water. All right, so that means that this cell is in a hypertonic environment, a hypertonic environment. So imagine, you know, uh, people can't stay in super salty bodies of water like the Dead Sea for very long, right? Because their cells will lose water to the environment because that water that in the salt Dead Sea is so salty that it actually draws the water out of your cells. Um, so you can't stay in there for very long. All right, so the hypertonic environment means that water is going to exit your cells. And uh, think about that. I'm going to reveal it to you later here. But what could happen if the cell is losing too much water? Well, I don't know. Let's talk about it later. All right, so this is a hypertonic environment, um, but a hypotonic environment, and be careful not to mess these two words up. They sound similar, but they're different. The opposites, actually. Hypotonic environment, the cell will gain water. So check it out. This time we have more solute concentration on the inside of the cell than we do on the outside of the cell. And there's more water on the outside of the cell than there is on the inside. So there's going to be what we call a net influx of water um, into the cell. So water is going to follow where, wherever there's the most solute, okay? And it's going to flow into the cell. And that's called a hypotonic environment, all right? So again, hypertonic water flows out, hypotonic water flows in. Okay, and a way to remember this, I don't know, it might help you out, but hypo blows up. So like water flows into a cell in a hypotonic environment and what can happen? It can blow up like a balloon or a water balloon, I guess. All right. Um, so let's talk about the implications that these environments have for plants and animal cells. Um, as I kind of hinted before, cells without cell walls like animal cells are best in isotonic environments, meaning that the water coming in is equal to the water going out. But plants with cell walls... Okay, that have this rigid structure on the outside, um, they are best in a hypotonic solution. And why might that be? Well, a plant 
is is dependent on what we call it's uh, it's turgor pressure, okay, or how much water is on the inside of the cell so that the the cells or excuse me, the plant can stay rigid. It can stay upright. Think about it. Plants don't have like bones like animals do. Well, vertebrates do. Um, and they can't, you know, the, how, so how do they stay rigid? How is a tree able to stand up? Um, well, it's because of turgor pressure and the, the uh, pressure water exerts on the inside of a plant cell. Okay, so a plant cell always wants to be taking in more water so that it can exhibit that force, that pressure on its plant cell wall. Um, so when a plant is healthy and it's happy and it's got enough water and it's in a hypotonic solution, that's what we call turgid. It's turgid, which means it's firm and it's in a healthy state. That plant will be able to stand upright uh, without any issues. Okay? Um, but if a plant cell is, say, in an isotonic solution, it's what we call flaccid. And another word for flaccid is that it's kind of like limp. All right? it's, not really, it's not exerting a lot of force on that uh, cell wall. And that suggests that it lost some water. Okay? It wants to be hypotonic, but it's an isotonic. That means it's flaccid. And, you know, if you, say, forget about your plants for a week when you're on vacation and you don't have your neighbor water them, um, your plant cells in the plants could become plasmalized, meaning that the membrane pulls, the cell membrane, the plasma membrane pulls away from the cell wall, and that results to the plant to, to wilt. Okay, so if the plant cell loses too much water, that means it's going to kind of like shrink, shrivel up within the plant cell wall, and it's going to become yucky like this, and that's when a plant cell wilts, all right? Um, in a hypotonic solution in an animal cell, though, okay, we don't, have, we don't have cell walls on our cells, so if this is one of our red blood cells and we end up in hypotonic solution or in a hypotonic environment, water's going to inflow, right, and it's actually going to cause the cell to lice. It's going to burst like a balloon. Because um, remember, the plant, or the, excuse me, the plasma membrane is kind of like the consistency of a bubble, right? So it's able to pop if there's too much water that comes inside. All right, so isotonic is when we're good, but if we're hypertonic, meaning that there's more solute on the outside than there is on the inside, that means that this cell can kind of shrivel up. Okay, so both of these can shrivel up. Um, but an animal cell, you know, you don't want it to be hypotonic, you don't want it to be hypertonic, you want to stay isotonic if you're an animal cell, all right, or if you have animal cells. So, all right, we're going to stop right there for right now because I want to spend two separate videos um, on tenacity osmoregulation, particularly because the next video involves a lot of math and uh, something called water potential. All right, so I'm going to stop right here, and we'll pick up uh, later on. See you later. Let me know if you have any questions. Oh, shoot.